At Team Toyota, they've been selling and servicing new and used Toyotas in your community for over 50 years. And you can reserve your next new Toyota with them today. You'll get a realistic timeline, and even in this crazy market, they won't charge you over MSRP. Or don't wait at all. With over 75 certified Toyotas, including a bunch of RAV4 and Highlanders, you can drive one home today. And you can always trust them to maintain your current vehicle. Their service and collision centers are high-tech, comfortable, and will save you time and money. Team Toyota can help you go anywhere you want, but they'll always be your hometown team. Just visit TeamToyota.net and choose from three locations in Langhorn, Glen Mills, or Princeton. Hello, folks. Welcome to the Phillies Talk Podcast. I'm Corey Seidman. He's Jim Salisbury. It's the morning of December 21st, so we're four days away from Christmas. We're four days into Hanukkah. And we thought, you know, there's no better gift for us than all of you out there, our listeners, our watchers, our subscribers. So we're opening up the mailbag for this edition. And this is a timely Santa bag. <laughs> Say that again? The Santa bag. Santa bag. And this is a timely podcast because in the wee hours of the morning here, <clears throat> The Mets made this swoop, this stunning move, agreeing to a $300 million contract with Carlos Correa, who the baseball world thought had been signed, sealed, delivered to San Francisco. But there were reports yesterday, Jim, that the Giants had concerns over Correa's medicals. And here we are a day later. He ends up in New York. The Mets weren't even thought to be in on him. They already had a superstar shortstop making $300 million plus. Now they have Carlos Correa. The Mets' incredible winter just continues. I mean, they have now they have two forty-three million dollar pitchers. And that's you know per season. Um, you know they lose to Grom, they Grom get Verlander. They have Lindor making over three hundred million uh, at short. Now they have Correa making over three hundred million at at third base. They resigned Nimmo on a big deal. Um, they're a powerhouse. The NL East is a powerhouse. Um, <clears throat> like you said, kind of an amazing turn of events. Um, and there's so many layers to this. Like, so the Giants and the and the the Giants had this fistful of money that they couldn't wait to spend. You know, they were talking about Judge, and and they were, you know, quite open in their desire to sign Judge. It didn't work, <clears throat> so they strike this big. Who was it? A three hundred fifty million dollar deal with uh, you know handshake verbal on on Correa. A week ago, and then in the meantime, the last of the shortstops comes off the book. Um, in Swanson and and Rodon comes off the book, and they don't finalize the deal over medical with Correa. I, you know, I got to think that would have they might have spent that on the pitching or, or or Swanson if, and now they got nothing for the team like the Giants that wanted to spend money was ready to spend money and wanted to bring a star in, and they got nothing now. A lot of questions on what happened here. Um, you know, the Giants sounds like they saw something on the medical they didn't like. Uh, sometimes that happens and deals are restructured a little bit. They're tweaked a little bit. The language is tweaked. Maybe the guarantee is tweaked, but the deal doesn't always fall apart. And wow, that sounds like the Correa people just pushed away and resumed talks with Steve Cohen of the Mets and um, got it done. He so he takes thirty five million dollars less than he could have gotten in San Francisco. I mean, big deal, right? When you're talking that kind of money, and and he and he goes to New York, and the Mets get better, and this NL East gets more intriguing. What a incredible turn of events, though. Um, you know, we're still waiting a lot of the details to come out. I mean, you know, Boris and Steve Cohen they hammered that thing out really, really quickly, and uh, I'm sure the Giants are like really scratching their heads here. Um, wondering what's next. Because they tried to get Harper a few years ago. They couldn't get him. They're a team that has a history, you know, going back to Barry Bonds, having that big star. Um, you know, they win three World Series uh, like a decade ago. And they always fill in that ballpark, great ballpark. And then their attendance is dwindled. And uh, they come out of a winter where they really wanted to spend with nothing. And then all of a sudden now Aaron Judge is getting introduced today, reintroduced, isn't, you know, his press conference to announce this huge contract uh, with the Yankees is happening in the Bronx and totally overshadowed by what's happening in Queens. Uh, you know, the Steve Cohen 
I was reading some of the quotes in the New York Post. He talked to John Heyman. <laughs> One of the quotes was, uh, you know, this is the guy who promised the World Series within three to five years. And he flat out just said, I hope the fans show up. I mean, he's giving the fans what they want, right? And that's a team that is really worthy of being supported. Um, and a team that, you know, has World Series personnel. You have really three teams in the NL, at least, that have World Series personnel. It should be an awesome race next year. The Mets won 101 games last year. They led the division for like 95% of the season. They didn't win the division. They had a quick playoff exit. They don't have a farm system that's ready to graduate difference makers to the majors. So they're desperate. You know, they're desperate to win. They just watched the Phillies get to game six of the World Series. When you think about this money that Cohen is spending, I, I, it's cliche at this point to talk about all the money he spends, but it's unprecedented. This Mets payroll, I just threw a graphic up here at the bottom of the screen. The Mets payroll is $104 million higher than the next highest payroll in baseball right now. They're at $377 million. They're going to pay a 90% tax on every dollar past that fourth and final luxury te- tax threshold, $293 million. So they're spending a lot of money beyond right. what the payroll is. Uh, Steve Cohen, one of his quotes uh, earlier this week was that, you know, I've been dealing with big numbers for a long time. This is nothing new to me. Right. Still, to just to see this number, I mean, they've signed this offseason alone, Verlander, uh, Senga, the big uh, overseas prospect, Correa, they re-signed Brandon Nimmo to that huge deal. They re-signed Edwin Diaz. They've made moves all over the place. And this payroll now is, I mean, you know, the Phillies payroll is huge. This is like $140 million higher than the Phillies. Well, you can add that 377 number, and I've seen it even higher, like 380, yeah. 380 and change. But you can add basically $110 million to that in the in the luxury tax penalty that they'll pay. And, you know, he shrugs his shoulders. And, um, hey, he's got it. It's his team. He wants to win. He makes no bones about it. He's doing what it takes, uh, and he's electrifying his fan base. So, um, you know, in Philadelphia – John Middleton is going out and getting the pieces he needs. Uh, I, I honestly, I think it's great for baseball. It charges up those fan bases. Uh, I know it's got to be difficult in Pittsburghs and places like that, um, but um, boy, uh, it, it's really the NL East is just going to be fierce, and, and it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. I mean, the, the Mets. I guess the the big concern is you got Scherzer and Verlander at the top, and you know they collect Cy Young awards. And they're great. Verlander was an American League Cy Young winner, but, you know, how old is he, 39? And then Scherzer's 38. You just wonder when Father Time is going to have a serious impact there. So there's risk. I mean, both those guys are making $43 million to pitch in 2023. Yeah, and Scherzer's missed time, I believe, two years in a row. Verlander uh, was mostly healthy in 2022. He did have a brief stint on the IL, but the Astros managed him throughout the season. He rarely went deeper than six innings in any start because they wanted to preserve him for uh, what the ultimate goal was, which they ended up fulfilling. But yeah, that's that's the big question with the Mets is that if either of those guys are, you know, for their, from their perspective, God forbid, both go down at the same time, do they have enough yeah. pitching to make up for it? When you were talking about the Giants and all the guys they've missed out on, it just made me think, you remember like in the early days of Citizens Bank Park, people speculated that a pitcher, a free agent pitcher would never want to come here because of how homer friendly it was? Well, I, I wrote about that all the time a decade ago, all the time. I mean, you had... You know, John Smoltz and David Wells, um, every time they would step foot in the ballpark, would openly mock the ballpark. I think mean, David Wells called it Williamsport. John Smoltz was very critical of the dimensions. Um, a lot of the Braves, I remember, of that era were very critical of the dimensions. Um, but, you know, if you make pitches, you can succeed there. And if you win and you put together a winning team that's going to give guys a chance to put a ring on their finger and play in front of great fans that are hungry for championships. I mean, if you put together a winning program, guys will want to come here. And so none of that, those David Wells criticisms or those John Smoltz criticisms, they all went out the window when a guy named Roy Halladay, the best pitcher in baseball at the time, only wanted to be in one place. Right. They all went out the window when a Cy Young winner named Cliff Lee only wanted to pitch in one place. So you make pitches, you can pitch here. Well, uh, the reason I, the reason I bring that up is because, like, the Giants right now, an argument could be made that for the exact opposite reason. Right. I'm sure that that the dimensions of that ballpark and the fact that it's been Bryce Harper's worst uh, offensive ballpark out of all 30 
the, where he's performed worst. I'm sure that played into his decision to sign with the Phillies over the Giants when they were making an aggressive push. Not the only reason, but I'm sure it played into it. I would agree. Uh, with sure, you. I, would, sure it, I would agree with you on that. Yeah. And I'm sure it played into Aaron Judge's decision this this off season with the Yankees versus the Giants. Uh, and honestly, if I'm a free agent slugger in my prime and I look at that ballpark and I look at the fact that Brandon Belt has like eight to ten homers suppressed every year, why would I pick that ballpark? Maybe it's like borderline blasphemous to say it because of how beautiful that stadium is. But when you're talking about some of these free agent hitters, I just wonder if that's factored into their thinking. It, 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 it It's possible, though. Carlos Correa chose it, you know, at 350. And, you know, it sounds like this was all initiated. This breakup, for lack of a better word, was initiated by some concern the Giants had. And that may have caused Team Correa, Team Boris to push away from the table, re-engage with Steve Cohen, who they were firing on the road with. Um you know, maybe the maybe the Boris camp called the the Giants bluff. Maybe the Giants were looking to restructure a little bit. I I, I don't know. I, I do know this. I saw the Giants win three World Series there, so uh, you can win there. <laughs> you can win there. You can put together teams. You know, the old horses for courses. You can build a team that can win there um, with pitching and, and defense. They weren't good defensively last year, but uh, you know, it's got to be really difficult on that organization. Um, it's because. They've they've seen their attendance go down, and they're in a division with that is such a, it's you know it's as it's as interesting as the NL East in its own way, stacked with talent. Uh, you desperate team down in San Diego doing everything it can to win the first World Series title in its franchise history. They want a World Series so bad, uh, and their actions speak that way. And they're filling that ballpark, and they're putting great young talent on the field. And then you get the tried and true Dodgers who are in it every year and just incredibly well run machine, great ballpark, great, great market. And in the Giants are sort of like, you know, on the outside looking in, even the even the year they win 107 games, um, they don't advance in the, in the postseason. So it, it's been a really kind of a tough run for them uh, just because, I mean, they had like a satchel full of money. And, you know, their, their president of baseball ops, Farhan Zaidi, I, I I think of him as, you know, I don't think he's a big, loud, boisterous guy. I think he's kind of very level-headed. But he made comments that, yeah, uh, we want Judge. You know, in so many words, we want Judge. We're going to do it, whatever. We're ready to do whatever it takes to get him. They couldn't get him. Um, and then they, for some reason, couldn't get this Correa thing done. Um, we'll find out whose fault it was. But in the last few days, Swanson went away and Rodon went away. Their own guy, Rodon. And, you know, that money could have been, you know, steered over to one of those guys or both of those guys. And uh, the timing, you know, just really, really hurts here. And and the fans, I mean, they were running out and buying Correa jerseys, right? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing turn of events. That might be the most amazing thing about it or the most unfortunate thing about it from a Giants fan's perspective is that you know there are hundreds of people that went out and did get those Correa uh, jerseys or yeah, I saw them. Uh, I saw a picture of somebody with one of them. It's uh, oh man, it's crazy. And you know, All right. those two guys, Lindor and <laughs> Lindor and Correa, on the left side of that infield. I mean, it's it. This is not a uh, original uh, observation, but it's like Jeter and A Rod again. You know, in in New York. All right, well, let's get to some of these questions. Before we pop open the mailbag, though, I want to mention that we got a ton of questions about Aaron Nola. Will he get a contract extension this season? Will the Phillies let it play out? So, Jim, I'm going to open that up to you. But I also have a question pertaining to Nola's contract, which is how high do you think it could go? Because he's going to be a free agent at age 30, yeah. coming off of all of these workhorse seasons, assuming good health this season. He's going to have the postseason experience in his favor. He's going to be the same age that Carlos Rodon was this offseason when Rodon signed a six-year, $162 million contract. And this is Nola's one chance at a humongous payday. He's coming off a pretty team-friendly deal. It was five years, $56.5 million, ended up being after the option was picked up. Uh, but could that thing get to $162 million like Carlos Rodon, or am I way off here? I, I don't think you're way off. Uh, you know, I, I preface any answer I, I, I give you. Uh, with I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen. And I think 2023 is it, 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 that's going to tell us what's going to happen because you know. And again, I, I don't know what the how the Phillies are going to approach this. I don't know what's happening. 
Uh, they're a team that operates very close to the vest. My hunch is they, they would kind of let it play out. Um, you know, but I guess you never know. Uh, are they working on something now? Who, who knows? But my hunch is they would kind of let it play out and, and see what happens. Um, they do have some young pitching coming. It's not guaranteed. It's got really good ceiling and talent, but you have to see what happens. But, um, you know, I think this is a huge year for Aaron Nola where he can, you know, write his ticket, go out and have a great year, finish in the top three or four of the Cy Young. Um, kind of don't show those late season concerns about fatigue. Uh, have a real consistent year, and you've seen the money these guys are getting. He's like the same age as Ty- uh, Taiwan Walker. He got $75 million. Um, You could see Aaron Nola blowing by that. Um, the Phillies are committed to winning. They're committed to having good players. If they make the um, – Judgment that they think Aaron Nola has a lot left in the tank, and I think they'll be right there and, and right and right in it. But you know, I also think the workload uh, is is probably going to be a concern. It leads the majors in, in workload since 2018, um, and uh, the fact that they have young pitching coming at some point, they're going to have to sacrifice some some homegrown player is going to have to leave. I would think to get the payday he wants. Um, and so they can, you know, move in some younger pieces, more for our younger, less less expensive pieces to balance out their payroll. I mean, that's I think the way a good franchise is run. So uh, whether or not that's Nola, whether or not that's Hoskins, I don't know. But I, I honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if both sides are going to be comfortable letting it play out a little bit uh, for Aaron Nola. You know, you've made a, you've had some real nice paydays already, and you could be looking at a monster one with a monster season, and and the Phillies can um, can decide which way they they want to go after that. They keep selling out this ballpark and win. Um, you know, they'll they'll be able to afford them, but I just don't know. That's a really really tricky one um, because you know, once upon a time that that was the age where you, you had a little, you scratched your head a little bit about guys, but now guys are getting big, big deals at that money at, at that age. And maybe he's the next one. So I think it's going to be a fascinating um, subplot to the 2023 season. You know, how does Aaron Nola pitch and what does it mean for his free agent value? I think it's going to be very, uh, he's very significant value if he goes out there and has a good year. Um, even if he has a mediocre year, we've seen number four, you know, Taiwan Walker, like a three, four, three in rotation, getting 75 million. That's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of glue. So we'll see. It's a lot of glue indeed. Uh, you know, I'm looking at what it's going to happen. Well, I'm looking at this list of free agent pitchers for next off season. And there's a handful of guys that are going to get serious money again. There's Shohei Otani. Oh yeah. Cool. Well, he, Steve Cohen's already, already getting ready on him. <laughs> There's Julio Urias. I would think the Dodgers are going to make a big push to re-sign him because they haven't been able to re-sign several of their own guys lately. Um, Nola, I think, would probably slot in third. Yu Darvish is going to be a free agent. He'll be like 37, 38 years old, so it's not going to be a long-term deal in the sense of some of these other guys. Lucas Giolito, Jack Flaherty, Frankie Montas, Blake Snell, Luis Severino, Miles Michaelis. So, you know, it's going to be a big, big starting pitching class, but the only two guys that stick out to me that are that may get paid or will get paid more than Nola would be Otani and Urias. So yeah, it's going to take something serious to re-sign him. And uh, you, you just always ask this question when a guy comes up at this sort of point in his career, which is, do you look at their track record of innings and reliability and say, that means this guy's going to give me 200 innings a year? Or you look at it and say, that means this guy might be you know, about to break down. The best example in recent memory of that that I think of is James Shields. You look at the first like seven, eight years of his career, he was a lock to give you 200 solid innings. And then at the end, it was just awful. I mean, he couldn't give you anything because the, the his arm was shot. Not that that happens with everybody, uh, but it's got to be some sort of consideration with Nola. No question. You have to balance out those two things. The durability, um, you know, weighed against what the odometer is reading. It's a, it's a, it's, it's an inexact science. It's a tough it's a tough call. I think Aaron Nola is going to get paid, though, because uh, I think he's going to have a good year. Okay, this next question comes from Danny Bosco, who asks, is there any chance the Phillies are able to trade Nick Castellanos this offseason? Uh, given the fact that he had a down year and he's still owed $80 million, I think it's going to be very difficult. Now, if they stepped up and ate, you know, I don't know, 50% of it, maybe. 
But I, I think they're more right now leaning toward uh, thinking, you know, kind of roll, you know, rolling the dice on the track record and thinking that he's more, a little more adjusted to the, to the uh, market. He really, I thought he came along, along pretty good at the end of the year. He seemed to fit in better. He seemed to be happier in the clubhouse. Um, really seemed to enjoy himself in that postseason. So maybe that that will help him um, have a better year in in twenty twenty three. He's got to stop chasing uh, spinners uh, off the plate. Uh, his, his selectivity is at the plate is what really, um, what really hurts him. So, I, 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 I'm sure they would listen and and would be open to to the right scenario. But I just don't know if there's a lot of teams knocking down their door for him. Yeah, Phillies fans should be hoping that Castiano sees like ten thousand sliders low and away this off season, uh, preparing for 2023 because it was just so clearly the hole in his swing and the 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 hole that pitchers attacked all year. My my two cents would be like put yourself in another team's situation. Why would they go out and trade for Nick Castellanos right now? Like you would either be doing it to take a flyer on a guy who costs you nothing financially if the Phillies picked up all the money or you I mean I don't know why another team would even do that right now. So it seems overwhelmingly likely to me that Castellanos will be on the roster uh, in Day 2023. Uh, this one comes from Philly Payne who asks with what the Mets are doing and continue to do do you think the Phillies feel any pressure to keep improving the team? I think no, I don't because I I just think you, you're dealing with a guy like Dave Dombrowski and and um and, and Sam Fold and, and John Middleton. And I'm not saying this. Knowing those three guys and knowing Dombrowski's competitiveness and Middleton's competitors, I think they want to get better all the time. It doesn't matter what the teams around them are doing. So I mean, maybe in the back of their head they say, Oh wow, but I don't think they're gonna do anything impulsive i think they're looking to get you know more relief help even before correa ended up in new york last night and i think they're still gonna try to go out and 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 get another reliever here and maybe another guy in a minor league deal in the bullpen and hope you get something out of it so i don't think um correa lights a fire under them or the mets winter lights a fire under them i think the phillies had a pretty good pretty damn good winter already with Trey Turner, what a signing. What a player that guy's going to be in Philly. What a player that guy's going to be in this lineup, in this infield. And and a good kind of mid-rotation stabilizer in, in Taiwan Walker and Aaron Nola in his walk year and um, Zach Wheeler. Hungry to get back to the World Series. Um, I, I just don't think they're going to do anything impulsive reacting to, to the Mets. I, I think they're going to stay focused on their plan, and I think their plan – was to get better this winter, and they have, and I think it's it's still there's still items they want to check off uh, in that pursuit, and, and probably in the bullpen. We've talked about Trey Turner so much this off season. I think we went 22 minutes today before even mentioning his name, which is pretty funny. Um, this one comes from Brian J Sports, who asks, "How long is the current window open for the Phillies?" Uh, interesting Wait. question. Bryce Harper's 30, Zach Wheeler's 32, you got Nola at 30. You signed Trey Turner, who's in his prime. How long is the current window? It's hopefully, it's tough to hopefully, hopefully the window is always going to be open. I mean, you're a big market uh, with an ownership group that wants to win and win consistently and win every year and is willing to spend money. And you have that guy in the in Dombrowski who 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 kind of knows the, uh, you know, knows how to get that done and, and be there. They should the window should be open all the time. They should be a contending team all the time. Uh, this is Philadelphia. I mean, you know. It should be, you know, the norm getting to the postseason. It shouldn't be happening once every 13 years. So, um, but to do that, you need a sustainable product. So you need ownership committed to winning and, and committed to spending where need be. Uh, but you need to spend in other areas, international, in the draft. And you need to continually, um, you know, Sustain your system so you're always moving a young player in when a guy gets too old or a guy moves on to another city. So that's how you sustain it from within, and then you supplement at the top in free agency. Um, and uh, you know, I think the farm system is moving in the right direction. They're about to; they're getting close to graduating some young pitching. They're going to need more. Um, so, you know, I, I think you know, this window is open and it can remain open if they continue to move young players here that make a difference and if they continue to have the willingness to supplement in free agency where need be. Um, you know, it's open and I don't see it getting slammed shut. I know 
Some guys are going to get older here. We don't know what's going to happen to Nola. Wheeler is going to be 33 next year. Um, but again, you've got young pitching coming. These guys should be able to step in and help. And then you need more behind them when the next crew gets you know up in years. Uh, you're going to have Turner and you're going to have Harper for a long time, but those guys should be contributors for quite some time. So I think the window is open, and I don't see it even moving – south for, for quite some time and if they do this thing right by moving by developing their own talent to fill in and become stars as the other guys get older then the window should stay open perpetually and guys you can determine that uh, the phillies young pitching prospects andrew painter mick abel griff mcgarry we've got a lot of questions about the phillies top pitching prospects uh this one from cake marsh who asks is there anything holding the phillies back from having painter in the opening day rotation how about McGarry? I think he's asking that, like, if one of those guys dazzles in spring training, would the Phillies be hesitant to, to carry them on the opening day roster as opposed to bringing them up maybe, say, weeks or months into the season? Um, I don't think so. I think they're at a stage where it's going to be best man wins. If, if Andrew Painter wants to go down there, I mean, we all know he's going to be in spring training. and If he, if he goes down there and, and you know, to steal a hockey phrase, stands on his head. How are you going to keep him away, right? He goes down there and dominates and shows he's ready. Dave Dombrowski's done it before. If McGarry does, he's done it before. If Bailey Falter goes down there and shows he should be the fifth guy, those guys will start in AAA. Um, but they're both starters, and I think they're both going to be here uh, at some point in 23. I don't know if it's April, May, June, or July, and then you're going to have to balance their innings and watch their workloads, but that's stuff these guys can do and make it work. Um, but I... <laughs> With this team's will to win and the way the front office and their pitching brain trust recognizes that those guys are going to be here next year. It's just a matter of when. Uh, if they show they're ready in spring training, I think you might see one of them break with the team. Yeah, I do. It's going to be it's going to be fascinating. But then again, uh, they talk about young pitching and they consider Bailey Falter a young pitcher. If he goes down there and and, and wins the job, then, then he's the guy. Um, you know, McGarry and – and um, Painter are only going to have so many innings next year. I, and I don't know what the number is. And I don't even know if there is a number. They have so many different ways to, to monitor workload these days and determine if a guy's getting fatigued and possibly susceptible to injury. There's a lot of different ways to track that. But so they, you know, Painter was like 102 innings this year. I would ex expect, like, you know, jump by 25 to 30 next year. Um, if he's. You know, knocking bats out of hands in Triple A. Why not get those innings in the big leagues, right? If if you're going to cap his innings or you you know watch his workload, why not get his best work in the in the big leagues? But he has to go to Clearwater and and you know show that he's ready with with all the little things in the game. And the game really speeds up up here. You know, holding runners, fielding your position, every one of those things is magnified in the big leagues. So um, they're going to be looking at all that. Um, but as far as do I see anything holding holding them back? I could see this team doing some brash and, and bringing one of those guys if they, if 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 they're ready and, and they're the right guy at that time. Jim, I'm just smiling here. I, I realize your hat, the Just LA. Is that a nod to the legend Larry Anderson? It is. Larry's doing some awesome charity work um, for folks uh, in in recovery from from like substance abuse and whatnot. And you can Google Just LA Apparel, and um, L, L Larry's doing. Uh, this great work with the Hope House in Philadelphia. And um, yeah, you can get these hats and they're actually really cool hats. So, so yeah. I like yeah, I like it. It's nice. So I'm going to get to a few more fan questions, but first I, wanna, first I wanna tell you guys about another podcast, the Someone You Know podcast from Independence Blue Cross. Opioid addiction is a national public health crisis and the Someone You Know podcast from the Independence Blue Cross Foundation offers inspiring stories that challenge stigma, offer hope, and humanize the disease of addiction. You can download the new season three of Someone You Know on all major uh, on all major podcast platforms. Jim, a lot of questions about the relief market. One guy in particular, a big name, this comes from our friends at the Absolutely Hammered podcast, one of my favorite follows on Twitter. Uh, they ask, just tell them, well, they say, just tell me the Phillies aren't going to get Liam Hendricks so I can move on. Uh, referencing the White Sox closer who's been elite in recent seasons, took a bit of a step back and owed a lot of money. Are those the guys that said I look like Barney Rubble? 
<laughs> are they? I don't remember. I think they are. So I'm not answering. I'm going to find that one though. I'm surprised yeah. nobody's memed that in some form or fashion. I'm not answering that question because. Uh, okay, let's skip it then. No, I'm let's kidding. Uh, that's what you get. You mess with Jim on Twitter. That's what you get. I think those are the guys that put out the bat signal, don't they? The Salisbury bat signal. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, no, they're good. They're funny. Uh, there's so many funny people on Twitter. Nobody's funnier than Six Six Star though. <laughs> Your boy, Six Star rules, man. The weekly Six Star mention. Oh yeah, we got away from that. We gotta we gotta keep Six 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 Star in there. He's uh he's the legend. Uh, Hendrix has owed a lot of money. What's he owed? It's fourteen point three three million this year, and uh, there's a fifteen million dollar option next year that automatically triggers if he's traded. So the Phillies are to trade for him now. It'll be two years, just under thirty million. Wow. What's the Phillies' highest paid reliever? Who is? Probably find uh, out this year. Off the top of my head, as I Google it. Uh, oh, Cable, they gave ten million last year. He's. Are you talking about currently on the roster? Yeah. Currently on the roster, so you just think in your head. Uh, I guess, wow, is it, could it be Alvarado? Alvarado's ma uh, due to make somewhere in the vicinity of like three and a half million. Oh, Matt Strom. Matt Strom, obviously, seven and a half million. Yeah. So it, it will be him. And then you have Alvarado making like three and a half. Uh, Sir Anthony maybe just going for two. So it is an inexpensive bullpen right now. And there's not a whole lot of appealing free agent options left. Um. So Hendricks is a salary dump, clearly, right, in Chicago? Well, like I would think they're going to be looking to get value for him, though. I mean, he's still one of the best relievers and one of the better relievers in baseball. I don't think you can get him for nothing. You'd probably have to trade something of value. Maybe they pick up a little bit, but I don't yeah. know. I don't think. Well, that's that complicates things because you know I, I just don't. You're not going to trade from your top tier of uh, young pitching prospects who are going to be here soon, um, and then that, that's a, a pretty pretty good salary to take on. It'd be a nice guy to have. I don't know that that's. Um, something they're focused on. I, I almost think like they maybe take a shot at somebody that's still out there and, and kind of roll the dice. The thing about bullpens is, you know, just because, you know, the new year arrives or, and, or spring training arrives or opening day arrives, it doesn't mean you can, you have to stop tweaking and improving and churning. That's one of the big, units i think in baseball that you go right to the trade deadline uh you can remake half your bullpen you know between the opening of spring training and and the trade deadline so you know the names they start with might be not not be the names they enter any pennant race with but hey hendrix has been good for a long time i just don't know that they can make it work get to a couple more here this one comes from dr juice who says it's a moot point now but why wasn't Gene Segura ever talked about as the Phillies' leadoff hitter? Contact hitter, decent speed, capable of stealing bases, although not the best situational awareness. And there were points over the years where he had a decent OBP, although if it's OBP, shouldn't it have also been Reese Hoskins? So if there's a lot in that question. Yeah. Um, I would say that my first response to why wasn't Segura ever really the leadoff guy is because when he was given those opportunities, the few and far between opportunities to lead off, it just didn't marry up well with his skill set. Like, he is not a hitter who goes up there and wants to take pitches or right. succeeds taking pitches. He's a guy who wants to be aggressive. And you don't want your leadoff hitter going up and chasing like a first pitch fastball out of the zone. So it doesn't really match up with what teams want out of the modern day leadoff hitter. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The selectivity um, is, is an issue or uh, would have been a concern. Um, I, I think there was probably last year, there was also a little bit of a left-right-left -left thing um, up at the top with Schwarber, Hoskins, and then, you know, often Harper, um, especially before he got hurt. Um, so I think they liked that. I also think they were very intrigued even before the season about Schwarber and the leadoff hole, and the left-right thing was part of it. Uh, but the fact that he had done it the year before and done it under Kevin Long and done it well um, was intriguing to them. And, you know, Segura goes down in, uh, what, May with the broken finger, and then they get hot in in June with Schwarber in the leadoff hole. And that's when Rob Thompson really kind of got committed to it, and Schwarber really liked it. And I think he wanted to kind of keep the guy where he was content and productive. So um, part of his Segura's skill set fits there, but part of it doesn't, as you articulated. So uh, I think it probably had more to do – with 
when they targeted Schwarber, they had an idea for him. And when they got him, they implemented that idea. And then Gene Segura got hurt. And and Schwarber took off in that spot. It, it never was, you know, the fit that um, they were looking for. I wonder where Gene Segura ends up, uh, how much money his next contract will be. And I do think that he's going to be a guy who has a pretty good 2023 season uh, there's going to be a lot of these guys who hit the ball all over the place that have higher batting averages because of the removal of the shift, and I think score is going to be one of them. Last question here comes from Stephen Wentz, who asks, uh, for our, t- our thoughts on the, on the best spot to watch a game at Citizens Bank Park, ignoring the Diamond Club or Hall of Fame Club. Yeah. I would say that going back to my fan days, I don't know, Jim, you've covered the team the entire existence of the ballparks. So I don't know if you've ever even seen a game in a vantage point other than the press box, but... I'll say that I've always liked Section 420. Uh, insert your jokes here because, <laughs> uh, because just with a bang for your buck, I mean, you're behind home plate and you're all the way up so that you have the view of the skyline. Uh, you have the view of uh, the entire field, and it's one of the more inexpensive tickets. So I would say that. I also enjoyed like thinking back to like the 07, 08, those great days where there was so much energy in the ballpark every night, like the standing room sections uh, being kind of like in the midst of all those people who are just as crazed as you were at those times. So those would be my two picks. Uh, what, what do you think? Is is Gelb up there in 420 with you? Yeah, it's the two of us. We're hanging out. Hanging out up there. <laughs> oh, God. Um, you know, I, I spend so much time in the press box. I There are some vantage points I like, and I don't even know what section this is, but it's – so it's right down by the um, right field foul pole. It's actually where I exit the building every night. So I go out through the Hall of Fame Club to those two glass doors. You know where those are, right? And then there's the foul pole right there. Is it like section 209 or something? There's like a canopy there. And sometimes you stand there and just kind of – it's a really nice vista. You got center city to the right. You got the scoreboard in front of you. And you got a beautiful view of the field. I'll tell you another cool seat. That's like section 211. I'm looking at a seat map right now, like 210. It's kind of a standing spot. And you get some concessions that are close. But I kind of always liked um, – I like that vantage point. That's pretty cool. Um, he, the Hall of Fame Club, I know um, the, the question you know, wasn't asked about the Hall of Fame, but the front row of the Hall of Fame Club, those are great seats where you can kind of lean right over. And another good seat in that building, and I don't think there's a bad seat in the building, uh, though you'd never catch me in Section 420. <laughs> um is uh so left field left field foul pole right to the um to the field side not foul territory side so and right there's a little wedge of a section there uh just on the left field side of the left field foul pole uh front row you can actually kind of put your feet up i think you can balance your drink and you can lean right over the field there those are pretty good seats um, if you're looking for a different vantage point, um, front row, right by the left field foul pole, field side. Um, but there's a lot of awesome seats in, in that ballpark. Um, and, you know, I mean, we're lucky to have that. That's it. I, I, I think of all the great ballparks, San Diego's really great. Giants is really great. Pittsburgh is really great. Um, Dodger Stadium is still an awesome place. Um, I, I still love Citizens Bank Park. To me, it just is kind of, even though it's one of the new ones, and well, it's, I guess it's the oldest one in the division now, but it, it's it's got a classicness to it uh, for a ballpark that's only been around, what, 20 years? Uh, I think it's a great one. So that's my two cents. Yeah, like 20, 30 years from now, it's going to be one, of, if it's still around, it's going to be like looked at as one of those, you know, I guess, somewhat like historic stadiums when you hear like when other announcers other teams come in they always talk about how beautiful citizens bank park is i think it's beautiful we're all just so used to it you know it's beautiful especially from that mid-level where you can see the city and off in the distance uh that's a that's you know another thing i love this is really a weird thing but um when i drive up patterson ab the trees in front of the the facade of the ballpark the brick exterior I think they're locust trees, if my 
my uh, my tree you know. lounge, locust trees, really good firewood, but don't get any ideas. But uh, <laughs> they're like full grown, full grown now, and they really, you know, look nice. I love trees around a ballpark, and when you walk in that first base, uh, I think it's first base uh, entrance. There's like some trees actually inside the ballpark, kind of. I really like that because to me, you know, uh, it's it should be a ballpark, and a park has trees. Then that's just one of my crazy little observations. Sorry. My my last thought on this question about uh, seating at Citizens Bank Park is that when I was a kid growing up, my uncle had um, season tickets first row behind the visiting dugout. He had four tickets, and we would only get to go like maybe once a year with him, and. The first time he took us, Vladimir Guerrero, uh, Vladimir Guerrero Sr. was coming off the field, and it was like the first superstar player, I must have been 11, 12 years old, that I was that close to, you know, coming off the field, and what a specimen that guy was. I mean, he looked like a he looked like he was a different form of species, you know, than the rest of us. Right. And, uh, so that was that was pretty cool. Those, those seats are just amazing to be able to see those guys up close, kind of humanize them as they walk off the field. Um, but yeah, just a, a beautiful ballpark and uh, looking forward to hearing it rocking next year coming off this big playoff run. So no question. And uh, before we cut out, uh, I think everybody, we woke up, we all woke up to that news today about the Mets. But Franco Harris passed away, man. That was a shocking, stunning thing to see. I mean, he was um, you know, still as a kid, remember watching – those you know, watching him play for the Steelers. Now we're at the 50 year anniversary of the Immaculate Reception. He passes away that that week, and I'm stunned. I was reading Ruben Frank's story, which is just an outstanding piece, like a of his personal interaction with Franco Harris. I can't recommend it enough. I love stories like that, and um, they they're so poignant. Um, Ruben's piece is so well done. I, I hope people read it. Um, and I was stunned to read that the Steelers had not retired his number yet. Um, wow. But very sad to see that Franco Harris um, has passed away. It just, it just seemed like, you know, he was one of those athletes from my youth that seemed to have a lot of class, you know. And Ruben's piece certainly um, supported that. So that was, that was sad to see uh, here at Christmas time. Yeah, I highly suggest you go out and, and check out Ruben Frank's piece at NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com on the Eagles page. He wrote about – the piece was remembering what was truly special about Franco Harris, and Rube wrote about how he was the most down-to-earth superstar athlete that he had ever been around. Uh, Rube got a chance to cover him up close several different instances, including when he was being inducted into the Hall of Fame. And it's a big loss for the NFL, for the Steelers, uh, if really for everybody in this area that was a, a fan of Franco Harris or football dies just two days before the Steelers were scheduled to retire his number uh, at halftime against the Raiders, the team which the, they played the uh, famous Immaculate Reception game. So check out that piece at NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com on Franco Harris. And thanks for everybody out there listening today to the Phillies Talk Podcast, this holiday edition of the Phillies Talk Podcast. Have a great week, a great holiday season, and we will be back in 2023. Thanks for listening.